third lesson, third topic, Hitler's actions 1933 to 1936. We're looking, of course, at why did peace collapse in the run-up to the invasion of Poland in 1939. We have to realize that, first and most importantly, it has to do with the person named Adolf Hitler, who comes to power in Germany on the 30th of January 1933. Now, there's an argument about Hitler's responsibility for World War II. Um, oh, Undoubtedly, over six years, he'll rebuild his nation, uh, he'll rearm, he'll be very aggressive. Um, and up until 1960, most historians believed he had planned this sort of step by step, that this was part of some sort of long term intentional program to to begin a second world war and then lead to, let's say, German world domination. Um, but now we start to see things in a little bit different light. Historians have expanded on that one understanding and provided a number of nations for a uh, number of reasons that the world, nations of the world got into World War II. Well, anyhow, um, one example is A.J.P. Taylor, a very famous British historian. He blames the League of Nations. He also blames Britain and the Allies for letting Hitler get away with it. He says that their policy appeasement, a topic or an idea that I introduced to you in the last lesson, was responsible for letting Hitler get away with it. And had Hitler been checked by the League of Nations, had the Allies not given in so easily, perhaps Hitler would have taken a different course. Uh, Taylor famously calls Hitler a gambler, not a planner. Now, what else? Um, he says, basically, of course, that the external factors that are as much to blame as Hitler himself. He blames World War II, not only just on Hitler, but worldwide economic depression in the 1930s, the weaknesses of post-war treaties like the Treaty of Versailles, which he believed could have been a much more harsh, particularly having to do with um, issues surrounding German armament, um, actions of the leading powers. He's very, very, very critical of the British for being the lead, uh, for giving in, but no more so um, really than he is of France for effectively ignoring Germany after, 19, after the uh, occupation of the Ruhr in 1924. He blames isolationism in the United States and really a opportunistic USSR for even partnering with the uh, cruel regime in Nazi Germany in 1939 in something called the Nazi Soviet Pact, which I'll talk to you about next lesson. Now, whether you believe that it was ultimately Hitler's plan or there are other people's responsible, you're going to have to make up your own mind because overall this whole unit deals with the fact that who was to blame for the start of the Second World War? And most of the questions, particularly the 10 mark essay questions, deal with that central fact. Now, just to recap, what are Hitler's foreign policy aims? Okay, here they are right here. Um, again, four mark questions. They love to ask this type of stuff. What are Hitler's foreign policy aims? Name four things. Anyways, here are five. The first one, of course, is to destroy the Treaty of Versailles. I'm not going to go into any more detail than I already have of what he wanted to destroy, but basically you can say all of it uh, as a starter and then work your way inwards from there. He wanted to create a greater Germany. He wanted to bring all German-speaking people into the Reich. He wanted to expand the frontiers of Germany, which had not only been limited by the Treaty of Versailles, but as according to a, mo a mo movement or a notion called Pan-Germanism, he wanted to uh, expand the borders much larger than it had been before the First World War. Hitler hated communism. He wanted to destroy communism and the Bolsheviks in Russia, who ironically he will ally himself with in 1939 for a very short period of time, but nevertheless one of his central principles is to destroy communism. Uh, this, All of this, uh, destroying communism and creating a greater Germany, is in the notion of acquiring Lebensraum, that means living space for the German people. He believed Germany was dangerously overpopulated and they needed to acquire lands, particularly the, in East Europe, in order to grow grain and food and all of the different things that this hungry German population needed to be so successful effectively. Um, and of course, lastly, his empire in Central Europe. Hitler wanted to have complete European hegemony, which means that he wanted to dominate Europe. The capital of Europe, he figured, would be Berlin, and Germany would become the dominant Central European power, if not the dominant European power, um, or even world power, when you consider the, the sort of the height of his ambitions. Now, what does he do? The first thing he does, and if you're searching for a chronological list or you're trying to make one at any time in the future, you want to put rearmament first. It's his first step. Rearmament was something he was not allowed to do in the Treaty of Versailles. The German army was limited to 100,000 men. But in 1935, Hitler begins a process of rearmament. Thousands and thousands of Germans are drafted into the army. 
Okay, he introduces what's known as conscription, where all males between the ages of 18 and 25 are forced to register and then do some military service. Okay, this was had a, I guess, a twofold effect. Number one, it was something the Treaty of Versailles said he couldn't do, and he did it anyway, which made him popular. And secondly, it helped reduce the problem of unemployment. Hitler comes to power in the middle of the Great Depression, and Germany has something like, oh gosh, remember, Mr. Rain, something like 6 million unemployed, I think, around 25% of the working population. And of course, being in the military is a job. So they get a job, and that helps uh, Hitler look really good, um, at least in his employment figures. Okay. He also knew that the German people supported this. He figured that he would be doing something in the face of the Treaty of Versailles. Maybe he'd have to back down if they did, made a big deal of it. But whatever it was, was this was something the German people liked. Okay. He begins the program in secret first, and then he displays it publicly. He starts blaming the League of Nations for failing to disarm and the failure of the World Disarmament Conference. You remember that, 1932 for the last unit. Okay. One of the things that League of Nations always wanted to do was would lead to world disarmament. Um, the fact that the British and the French primarily would have disarm in the 1930s meant that Hitler felt that completely justified that he would get away with rearming the German uh, army. And of course, when the League of Nations uh, doesn't disarm, Hitler blames them and he withdraws from the League of Nations in protest, which of course was a staged protest, and he does this in 1933. Now, um, all of this was very popular, and I guess I've repeated a lot of these points. Um, Hitler also knew that Britain was sympathetic, and this is an important point. He, he read the mood of European powers very, very well. He, he knew that Britain was sympathetic. People there thought that the Treaty of Versailles was too harsh. They had changed their tone since 1919, and Britain thought that Germany would be a communist buffer if perhaps... Um, they were allowed to with, uh, rearm. And what is a communist buffer, you ask? A buffer is a state between Britain and the Soviet Union, a communist country, that if the Soviet Union tries to expand communism by military force, Germany, they thought, might be able to stand in the way. My, how were they were wrong. Okay, anyhow. Um, one of the other things Britain does in this early period, 1933 to 1936, is sign the Anglo-German Naval Agreement. You'll recall that this was also discussed in our last lesson, the League of Nations. The idea that countries, in order to ensure security, would go outside of the League of Nations in the 1930s because it was seen as weak, also further um, worked to weaken the League as an organization for keeping peace. Britain also did this, of course, through this Anglo-German naval agreement. The Treaty of Versailles had said that Germany was to have a tiny, tiny navy, almost nothing. But Britain says that it it's allowed in 1934, uh, I believe, um, to build a navy that was at least 35% that of Britain. And they were allowed to have submarines that were at least 45% of what Britain had. Essentially, this legalized the German naval rearmament, and it was made, of course, without pr obtaining prior agreement with France or Italy or the League of Nations. It gave an impression that it was quite okay for countries to pursue their national interests regardless of others. Mussolini in Italy took the cue from this and decided that he would extend Italy's colonies along the same selfish principle. <coughs> the Saar plebiscite of 1935. Um, the Saar was a region in southwestern France on the Alsace-Lorraine French border that had been run by the League of Nations since 1919. And you may recall from one of the earliest lessons in this entire course that the Saar was supposed to be run by the League of Nations for about, I think it was 15 or 16 years. And in 1935, the League of Nations, as promised, allowed the people of the Saar region to vote for whether that region should return to Germany. Hitler was a little bit weary of this. He actually wasn't sure at first if they would do so. So him, he sent his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, to mount a huge propaganda campaign to persuade the people. 90% of the people in the Saarland ended up voting in favor of joining Germany. This is a huge boost to Hitler's power. Not only that, he gets a big, um, uh, very important industrial region. Uh, uh, the Saar produces a lot of Germany's coal. It is a legal means of extending Germany and also uh, showed that he had um, 
he had a, a degree of popularity and that the people in Central Europe, predominantly Germany and German speakers, were behind him. Hitler, of course, declared that I have no more demands. That's not true at all. Um, but at that particular point, he was fair enough to say. The, really, the last thing he does in this period is the remilitarization of the Rhineland in March of 1936. This is really Hitler's first big risk. The Rhineland is a large area on either side of the River Rhine. Okay, It's western border of Germany. Um, <clears throat> it's the western border between Germany with France and Belgium. Germany had, of course, used this area to launch the two wars we've talked about at great length, both the Franco-Prussian War and, of course, the First World War. Um, by putting huge military forces in the Rhineland, they were able to invade both France and Belgium simultaneously in 1914, for instance. The Treaty of Versailles had explicitly forbade the Germans from placing military units in there in order to prevent a surprise attack in the future. The Locarno Treaty of 1925 confirmed this demilitarized border, you recall. This was that treaty that um, was made outside of the bounds of the League of Nations, but brought Germany into the League of Nations by <clears throat> sort of ratifying its borders. And in this treaty, Germany accepts the Treaty of Versailles. By doing this, Hitler was taking his biggest gamble. This was a very, very sensitive region to the French. To withdraw, if he were to put his military in and had to pull back, it would be absolutely humiliating, but he was prepared to do so. He was really at this point not ready for an allied invasion and the he was thinking that well he'll try it um and see what happens but if the allies <coughs> i guess move into germany to check his invasion of the rhineland <coughs> or his remilitarization of the rhineland he'd pull back hitler of course being the gambler that he was in many cases um gambled correctly the allies did not um did not do anything about it. He made a very good calculated risk. France and Russia signed at most what's known as a mutual assistance pact, guaranteeing each other protection against German attack, but they don't, as they should have done, do something militarily about his uh, remilitarization of the Rhineland. Hitler claims the Rhineland was remilitarized re because Germany was under threat from both sides. Hitler knew the mood of the British hadn't changed, <clears throat> and he felt it was pretty much the right time in the right place to put troops in the Rhineland. The country he really worried about, though, was France. And France, as we saw, does very little. The German army, had France decided to do something about it, was not fully rearmed. In fact, many of the Germans went into the Rhineland without guns. The League of Nations, at this particular time, completely focused on what was happening in Abyssinia in 1935 and 1936, could do nothing about it. Um, this way, Hitler also picked the timing, actually, quite well. He was able to <clears throat> remilitarize the Rhineland. The League could do nothing but condemn it, but the League had already shown itself to be ineffective in Abyssinia, so Hitler was happy to ignore that. The French themselves were completely divided over what to do. They signed this mutual assistance pact with, with the Soviet Union, but at the same time, they're doing all of this. Are they ready to invade? The answer is no. They were in the midst of an election campaign, a huge financial crisis. The socialists had uh, come to power at the same time as they're remilitarizing the Rhineland, and they're talking about peace rather than war. And France refuses to act without British support. And we already know that the British had been pretty sympathetic to not say Hitler's earlier moves at this particular time, so the gamble Hitler makes pays off. Hitler, in an effort to keep peace, promises a 25-year non-aggression pact with the Western powers. And of course, we know that this isn't worth the paper it's written on, but at the time, for, it was enough for Britain and France to say, fine, yeah, whatever, it's yours, you can put your army in it. Now, that's really all there is to this lesson. We'll look at more later, we'll do some questions as this last slide seems to indicate, but, um, if you have any particular questions about any of the sort of the topics we've talked about, maybe even the League of Nations, if you can't remember what the Locarno treaties are, make sure you write that down and ask me in class. I'm happy to help you out.